So now it's time for questions and comments, and I hope that uh, these uh, very uh, nice and good presentations uh, have inspired you with some uh, interesting uh, points. Maybe you have also contribution to give. Thank Please, you. first speaker. Uh, Shandra Demeter from uh, Canada and C3. That was a phenomenal panel. Thank you very much. Um, and to, in the spirit of uh, discussion and not argument, as was discussed in the first day, uh, I'll add another uh, parable or uh, saying for uh, transparency, uh, Baha'i saying that in the, uh, through the clash of many opinions comes forth the spark of truth. Um, but my, my question is, uh, you, you raised it as when there's a clash between these fundamentals. So as a physician, if a patient has a right to refuse therapy, and the state steps in if it's a child to make a decision uh, on a societal basis. But, so, but the other, the converse is what's happening in medicine, especially in radiology, is as a radiologist or as a nuclear medicine physician, there's a lot of consumer-driven procedures where, in my mind, there is no justification in my value system. I'm not saying who's right or wrong, uh, but uh, whole body CTs without any indication lead to all kinds of false positives and I think does more harm than uh, good to the patient. So that's a conflict and I, I would like to hear some uh, discussion on uh, how, from a radiologic protection point of view, how we deal with that conflict, the converse of what you said. I wouldn't treat a patient if they said no, but now the patient wants something that I'm not comfortable giving them. Thank you. Who would like to, to answer? Maybe from the floor. This is a very important question, so we, we need to elaborate a little bit around Yes, Maria, uh, it would be nice if you, you, you take the microphone. Thank you very much. I am uh, Maria Perez from the World Health Organization. Uh, I, am not, I am not sure if I will be able to give an answer, the, the right answer, because I think it's a, it's a key question on which we are still working on, on this. But I think it, it shows, um, I like very much the, the point of the conflict, is what we identify in one of the workshops, the dilemmas in the medical area on these four principles. The example here um, is a combination of the, what the, the science and the experience of a professional uh, says about what is the best for the patient. So two components of the three components of the good medical practice, the evidence uh, and um, the, the experience. On the other side, the values and the preferences from the patient. And there is a responsibility from a professional to, to inform the patient about what is the best for him or for her. And I think in that conflict, the way to solve the conflict is going through what we call the informed decision-making process, involving the, the individual patient, in this case probably a symptomatic individual, in the final decision that this whole body CT will do more harm than good in his or her health. Then you have to see what is the, the situation in different countries of the world. I think that this issue of the uh, using uh, radiation in, in healthy people is today one of the highest dilemmas in the principles of ethics in radiological protection in medicine. Thank you, Maria. Ted? Thank you. I, I don't think I want to a answer the question. I think I'd rather ask one. Uh, I hope this is part of the discussion. Thank you. There have been uh, a lot of discussion of, of how, to make, how to make choices. And there was a suggestion of looking at characterizing the, the options in some fashion. I think if, if TG94 could put an approach to characterizing the choices that Maria and, and our, the first question we're talking about, what aspects, what types of aspects could be, uh, from ethics could best assist in characterizing the situation such that a choice between option A and option B could be made on an ethical basis. I think the how to characterize that. And one, one example I might give is when you're looking at 
uh, a situation that involves occupational exposure in order to make a, a, a unit more safe to, say, to prevent public exposure. So there's worker exposure versus public exposure and you need to balance those two in some fashion when deciding what's the best thing to do, how much work should I really put forth to get something done. So the ethical aspects of that would be of, of, very, of use in, in trying to make such a decision. Any, any other comment or question? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry I'm not looking. I, I, I only wanted to react, react on uh, what has been said here. I mean, in theory, it's called incommensurability, two values that are in conflict with each other. But of course, um, ethical issues can never be called ethical conflicts because you cannot really find a solution by fighting over an ethical issue. So um, it is true that maybe different values can maybe be perceived differently in different cultural contexts, but in the end, uh, as, as you were also suggesting, um, the, the possibility of deliberation uh, between those who are involved in, in that, the example you gave, uh, the doctor and the patient, would need to be an, a universal principle that really transcends all cultural differences on, on the balancing of values, I would say. So, and there it, it is, I come back again to what I, to what I said. Uh, if there is this kind of ethical issues where you have dilemmas, then the only thing you can do is find trust in the methods. And, and you made it explicit by saying it is a dialogue, a dialogue, a, 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 an, in, an informed uh, decision making based on a dialogue, in that case, between a doctor and a patient. And then you find trust in the method, and there will be some solution anyway. And uh, the, no matter how long you have to talk, so to speak, but there will be some solution coming out of it, but it cannot be some kind of fight. It should be some kind of informed decision making that is really, f that find trust in the method. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Thank I you. don't know who was first, but it's not a problem. <laughs> Ranaji Chakraborty, member of C1. First, one little comment about the last speaker's interfaith uh, cultural quotations. The question of uh, your question about empath empathy may be addressed by another quotation from Mahavarata Bhagavad Gita, which says, Satang bada, Priyang bada, Ma bada, Appiya Satam, meaning to speak the truth, speak it pleasantly, but do not speak the truth unpleasantly. That probably answers in the empathy question. But I have a question for the entire panel. In biomedical science, we talk about quality of life in, in judging risk-benefit analysis of any intervention program. In the context of radiation protection, was there any discussion on ethical issues using the concept of quality of life? Okay, who, who would like to, yes? I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, I definitely think here the question of empathy comes again. I'm sorry I'm pushing it, but, but uh, the question of empathy comes in again because you're, I think you have to talk to the patient if you have time, which is also a question, but theoretically you have to talk to the patient and find out what his worries are and his quality of life may be very much influenced by not having this x-ray because he's so worried because his father and grandfather and don't know what have had this and that disease and he wants this to, to be sure to, have, to lead a life where he knows I don't have that problem. Uh, from a risk perception, from a risk um, management point of view, it would may, may be nonsense. You would say the risk of inducing a cancer by this treatment is much bigger than, than whatever uh, would come, uh, what, what, the risk that he would have. But from an empathy point of view, his quality of life may very much be influenced by that decision. Uh, so I, I don't have a, a clear answer, of course, but I think that that would give you a different, give the doctor a different perspective of what to do. Thank you for your contribution, anyway. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I'm Andrew Rivard. I'm the radiation safety, uh, safety chair at the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And I think that this question about this indecision about whether or not a radiological study is indicated, the indecision of it, and when a patient comes to the emergency room and says, I want an x-ray, and the physician then is faced with this ethical and moral dilemma of whether or not to obtain the x-ray to provide the patient with some sense of relief from that, from the question, do you have disease? And the bit technology, our ability to examine a patient head to toe has taken precedence over basic things such as a history and a physical examination. This has become a major issue with radiological protection because if you remember, would you actually do an x-ray of your foot to, to find out your shoe size right now? I mean, everyone here would say no, right? That's just not indicated. But then when you go now to the emergency room and you say, do you have a fracture? And the physical exam maybe not even be done by the physician. It's seen by maybe a screening triage nurse. And then now your decision now as a, as a group is, is this something that should be done? Because radiation is being administered on excessive amounts in the emergency room. And I think it's a precedence here to make a stand to say, really no, screening examinations in the setting should not be done unless it's medically indicated. And by taking that risk away from the physician then to take that decision, that indecision away, because otherwise it propagates more radiation. Uh, and that's just to answer the question. The burning question is, should it be done? Thank you. Yes. But, but, sorry, uh, before. Just to follow up on that, because I think there's another dimension too. Uh, it's not always the case that the patient is coming and wanting some kind of reassurance. Sometimes there are other driving factors in society that are driving the need for those kind of CT scans, for example, insurance policies, that if the medical insurance is demanding that you uh, cannot sign a medical insurance until you have some kind of CT scan, I think that's another area where we really need to look very carefully about what the driving factors are behind the use of uh, uh, excess medical radiation. But I definitely agree with your points here. And I think your, your question really deserved a, a much better answer from the panel here than uh, has been given yet, because it really is an area of uh, great importance. Thank you, Deborah. The next speaker. Thank you. First, I would like to thank the organi organizing committee for having brought this uh, session on ethical issues, which gave us the broader picture to our day-to-day -day activity. Then I have two questions, uh, one for uh, Deborah. You, you were saying that we shouldn't treat uh, ionizing radiation differently, than, uh, differently from other environmental uh, stressors. My impression is that we treat an, uh, ionizing radiation more severe, severely than we treat other contaminants. And one of the proofs, to my opinion, is the very existence of the ICRP and the huge effort uh, devoted to radiological protection. And uh, the other question is for uh, Gaston. You advocated a fair governance of uh, nuclear energy, and it would be, of course, an ideal, uh, ide ideal image, and we already began to discuss it uh, during the break. But here also, are not we demanding more, than that more from nuclear energy than we are demanding from other forms of producing energy, or in general from uh, large technological endeavors? Thank you. Deborah first. Yes, the, the different ways of treating the stresses differently. I mean, if it's the case that you have different bodies deciding on uh, what levels of risk are acceptable or not, whether that can even be done, <laughs> uh, it, that's sort of a procedural difference. Uh, the other idea is whether the standards that are set for ionizing radiation are different from those set for standards for chemical stresses. So we might look at... Um, the types of uh, uh, risks that are accepted in other 
in other areas. And in the environmental area, perhaps that's easier. Perhaps we are in a much easier situation because historically there has not been that separation. So there's possibly uh, opportunities for interaction here that is not so easy when we come to the impacts on humans. Um, but I, I do get all other things being equal. There should be no reason to treat ionizing radiation differently. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> but uh, one thing that we are seeing, just to follow up on that, I think you're seeing a tendency for radiation protection authorities to be um, incorporated in other areas of public health. I'm not sure whether that helps in regulators. I mean, I'm a university academic. I don't know what goes on. But it's something that I've noticed. Rather than the radiation protection authorities standing separately, mm -hmm. uh, there's an incorporation. And it would be interesting to see how that um, public health uh, merging would uh, impact on uh, yeah, at least public health issues with ionizing radiation. I think the energy question is a completely different one. Uh, an answer in, 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 uh, in two parts. In the beginning I said that uh, the problem with nuclear is that it is really um, fair treatment is um, hindered by what I call a comfort of polarization over the issue. So it's really a debate pro contra and none of the parties actually makes uh, attempts to really convince the other. They really live an elegant life in their own comfort zones. I give two examples from policy. I remember one um, um, conference organized by the European Commission in Brussels. The title was Sustainable Energy for the Future. So I went to that conference and uh, I saw in the program the word nuclear was not mentioned once. It was about um, new technologies for fossil fuels, carbon capture and storage, and of course renewables. And I cannot prove it, but please, please believe me, down the hallway was another conference organized by Euratom. The title was Sustainable Nuclear Energy for the Future. <laughs> really true. So, so this is what I call the comfort of polarization, really in the practice of politics. And it's of course, I mean, the problem with nuclear is that it is really historically locked into a structure, Euratom, that prevents all kinds of comparative assessments of energy technologies, not only in politics, but uh, mainly in research, also the research structures. Okay, this is just an example of Europe. Then another one, I attend climate change conferences of the United Nations since Kyoto. I missed a few of them. Nuclear energy has never been an official topic of official negotiations on those United Nations climate change conferences. Never. It has been discussed in the side, in the, in the corridors, in workshops around. It has been a topic once, once on uh, when, um, okay, these are details, when, uh, when they were, the countries were talking about whether it could be seen as a possible technology in the clean development mechanism. So where um, countries can really, the idea was that if countries, industrialized countries, build clean technology in developing countries, they could really have some flexibility on their targets. And that was the only one. So there's nobody bringing the issue on the table because every country likes it the way it is. Those who don't like nuclear don't want to talk about it. Those who like it also don't want to talk about it. So that's the first thing. The second uh, answer could be, uh, of course, it should not be taken separately. It should be taken up in energy governance. If, if people ask me, Gaston, are you pro or, con or against nuclear? Then I say, it's a stupid question. It's a meaningless question. Um, because there are three priorities in policy that, can, that really are the principles of a fair energy debate. The first principle is maximize energy savings. Nobody is against that. The second principle would be maximize renewables. Nobody is against that. But you have to do it with public participation. The third principle would be for the rest, everything that you cannot do yet with those two policy principles up to the near and far future. You have to organize policy and confront nuclear with fossil fuels in a real confrontational uh, fair debate. And these are the three principles of fair energy governance. So nuclear plays a role in it. Thank you. Next. Um, ah, you, uh, you disappeared. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, if you have to take a radiograph or something in medical or even whole body scan is justified by a competent physician, it's all right. 
Now there are a lot of CT scans or similar scans are taken not by competent physicians and sometimes it is somehow corrupted among a team of medical doctors that they put money together in some countries and they buy a very expensive CT scan and they have to catch up with the cost of that CT scan. So whatever going on, they ask for a CT scan or something similar to that. So this is uh, the actual problem in many, many countries. Even I have seen that in some European countries, maybe in, in some. So what can we do in such cases? And do we have any sort of uh, formulation in the ICRP to prevent that? somehow to guide those not to do it. This is a very, very important uh, issue in radiation protection. Thank you. Thank you. Someone wants to react? Okay, so Anna, uh, is there any... Uh, you, you no, I, I'm facilitating the, <laughs> the discussion. Deborah, you want? Well, I can react if no one else does, but it will be on an educator head, um, better education of uh, radiologists, I would say, and including the kinds of things that uh, Gaston has been saying, uh, better reflection over the ethical dilemmas. I don't know whether it will help. We've had medical ethics in training for um, decades, and uh, that doesn't mean that all the medical profession is without uh, problems. But uh, I, I think what's being done on the ICRP in terms of improving understanding on the, the risks of CT is a way to go. But mm. I think it has to include an educational dimension as well to get these issues discussed during training. Yes, thank you. In fact, may I, uh, in fact regarding your previous comment you know, that you mentioned about the risk of different tasks in the environmental issues, one thing I mentioned earlier which can somehow clarifies this is the de definition of a radiation worker. If we say that, as I said before, a radiation worker is a member of public who receives additional r radiation due to occupational exposure. We can define a driver. A driver is a member of public <laughs> who receives radiation, and he has the risk of driving in the street or whatsoever. And if we can find the risks that we have, then we can equalize the risk of all professions as we originally in the ICRP visualized this way, that the risk of any work should be the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I will take a last question, and then we Sorry. close the session. Sorry. Oh. Just uh, in connection to this uh, <laughs> last uh, question, I would like to remember that ICRP has already paid very attention to the question of justification in case of medical exposure. Things so we have three level of justification in the, just the case of the medical exposure. So it's quite a different and uh, high attention to this case already done. I guess. Okay. But maybe beyond the ju justification, there are other ethical issues that have been touched today, and it will be probably interesting to look at that in detail. Last question I, or comment? Well, I, I just wanted to address some of the safeguards that are in place for physicians to uh, enhance justification. They're not perfect. And, and I asked the first question uh, a bit in secret because I'm working with Marie on this very topic. So I, I, I have my own answers, but I wanted to hear other ones about... Uh, this ethical dilemma. Anyways, uh, physicians uh, in their training, there's appropriateness guidelines for all physicians in diagnostic imaging in most countries, the UK, US, Canada, and part of that is part of their training is the best test for the ideal, you know, the, the ideal test for the patient with the cl clinical indication. And in some systems, how you get paid is audited to make sure that you're ordering appropriately. And, and, and interesting, that's in the US because a lot of it's due to insurance and they're, they're the highest use of DI, but if you're in an insurance healthcare system and there's an audit that you, you did an inappropriate test, you, you may not get reimbursed. So I think there's different levers 
to ensure justification, but they are there. They're not perfect, and uh, they, they obviously need uh, more attention, um, but there are some mechanisms in place. Thank you. With this comment, I will close the, the session. I think it was a very interesting, to say the least, a very interesting session. I'd like uh, to thank, once again, all the speakers. We can applaud.